get an hour live. We also live on Facebook. People will start, you'll see at the bottom, rich people will start tuning yeah. in now. Awesome. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be good. Yeah, I'll wait to share the fun fact as well. Oh, yeah, there we are. Morning, Jane. I can see Jane's here so far, the first one in. Great. Hope you're well. Hi, Lou. Hi, Lou. I don't know, do you know Lou? <laughs> I know Jane. Hi, Beverly. Hi, Rachel. There we go. They're all dropping in now. Morning, Ben. I'll give you a call a little bit later, Ben. I could be catching up with you, actually. Cool. So we'll just give people a minute or so just to yeah, tune in. Morning. So, yeah, Rachel's dropped a nice little message. Good morning. Yeah, cool. It's live and the technologically stuff is working. We have a dog in the background. <laughs> okay, cool. So now's a good time as any to start. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, attendees, delegates, for coming and joining us today um, at Digital U, the final day of the conference, which has been running week long from starting on Monday. And we've got the final three webinars followed by a um, pub quiz this afternoon at four o'clock. So free, free to join that. Um, I'm Chris Morris, the, the co-founder of Social Media, Two Social Media rather, and Digital U. And yeah, we, we put together the whole concept of Digital U about three years ago to really help educate and help businesses, I suppose now more than ever, transition into this digital age. Yeah, by giving back time and our expertise and, and we basically pulled together a lot of experts from our connector base, like Rich, who's come to talk to you today about how you can really they make the most out of some of the tools and apps that are available to utilize during this time. Um, so that's it about me. Fun fact, we're having a talk with Rich before and I was like, right, I need a fun fact to share. I don't want to do the boring stuff. So here's your fun fact. Rich really loves um, Japan. He loves the culture and the tech, which then inspired him to name his cat. I don't know the name of the cat. Could you pick Yeah. <laughs> that's a good name. It but means to live in Japanese. <laughs> the Japanese name Cat, who is now famous on Instagram to the tune of 130,000 Instagram followers and around that. Yeah, 137. So, yeah. Ah, what's a few thousand between? Yeah, yeah, seven, <laughs> yeah. Um, And massively famous in Italy. So, that's that. I thought that was cool and fun. So, I thought we'd share that. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over to Rich now. I'm going to give him the power. The technology is working. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, really nice to meet everybody. Thanks for coming down this morning. I know it's very hot outside, so I really, really appreciate everybody joining us. I'm just going to um, take you through um, the presentation now. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully people can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, I promise this isn't a, a sales pitch. Uh, just to tell you a bit about Kumo. Uh, there's four main pillars um, to the work that I do as part of that. Um, so the video, which is video production, editing and motion graphics, audio, so that's audio production, podcasts, and uh, voice technology, so like Amazon Alexa uh, development, things like that. Social media, so that's social media planning, strategy, content, advertising, programmatic, and then training, which is pretty much what we're doing today. So that can be one-to-one -one training, group training, and that's across all the social media channels and digital um, channels as well. Um, and then clients, yeah, just, a range really, uh, charities, um, sort of voluntary sector, um, universities and schools, and also I do quite a lot of content work with people like Now TV and Netflix and other people. But that's all on the website, so that's a sales pitch out of the way. I shall now move on to the presentation. So we're going to cover three things today, and I'm really excited about all of these. And although they seem quite disparate, they are actually connected in, uh, in quite a few different ways. So first of all, we're going to have a look at um, video conferencing. Uh, we're going to focus on Zoom, and obviously we're using Zoom today. Um, we're also then going to have a brief look at live streaming as well. There's so many options out there that will help you, your business to um, reach an audience using live streams. Then I'm quite excited to be taking a look at Apple Clips, which is a great um, free tool on iOS, which allows you to um, sort of quickly and simply build really high impact videos that you can use for social media advertising um, and things like you know, Facebook ads and Instagram. And then we're going to round things off this morning with a look at podcasts and how we can use the ACAST platform to, uh, to distribute and create podcasts. So let's kick things off. So we'll start off with video conferencing. Now, we've all been in lockdown for quite a while, uh, working from home, so you're probably familiar 
you know, with quite a few of these platforms. And there's a lot of, all the big players are involved, Facebook, Google, Apple, everybody's obviously got a stake in this. Um, so people will probably be familiar with Google Meet, which used to be Hangouts. Um, if you've been on Gmail for the last month, you've probably been hit by numerous requests to kind of set up a Google meeting. Here's a Google meeting, here's a link, because they're really pushing that very hard. Um, there's also Microsoft Teams as well, which is aimed at more of a corporate sector. So a lot of businesses are running that because it integrates with Office 365. And Teams grew out of Skype originally. Skype then kind of became a, bus a business function called Link. And then Link was then sort of created into Microsoft Teams. And then there's BlueJeans, which is a, a US-based um, service. Um, that provides really good video and audio quality, but can be quite expensive. A lot of the larger um, US companies use that. So Facebook use that quite extensively, uh, people at like Intel as well. But we're going to be talking about Zoom mainly today. And Zoom has really been a huge success story um, out of lockdown and working from home. It's got about 30 million active users now. Um, and it's been really popular. So people are using it for everything from kind of sharing choir and band practices to school PTA meetings to big corporate meetings. And even the sort of, you know, UK cabinet have been meeting on Zoom and doing cover meetings and things like that. So Zoom is probably the platform at the moment when it comes to video conferencing. So in terms of setting up Zoom, obviously we're all on Zoom at the moment, but you know, if you were setting up new members of your team, obviously it's important to get your account set up. Now in Zoom, you can do that in a couple of minutes. It's quite straightforward. One thing that a lot of people forget to do, and I think this is quite important, is to check your network speed. So if you've ever been on a kind of video call and it's very choppy, you might have video going in and out, people like loops, losing sync and audio, it's probably because there's a problem with the network. So there's a couple of tools you can use for that. There's fast.com, which is a free service offered by Netflix, and that allows you to check the speed of your network. The speed test is also really good. Um, you just run those um, from those, those web pages, and it will tell you the speed of your network. Now you don't need a particularly fast network speed, normally about five megabits per second upwards is fine. Um, one thing I would suggest is not to use 4G because sometimes a network can be a bit patchy and it can be fast at one point and then slow at another. So sometimes that can lead to some problems and you know, bottlenecks and where things cut out. And if it's important, do a test call as well. So for instance, before we did this session this morning, Chris and myself just went through and we just tested the line and made sure everything was working. So if it's an important meeting, make sure you kind of testing things as well. Um, the main thing you want to do, just if we have a look at this image here, this is a result from fast. Obviously, the big number there is the speed you're getting down the line. Obviously, the upload speed is, is, the, up, is the speed it's actually connecting in terms of uploading. And this latency figure as well. Latency, you kind of want that to be as low as possible because if you have high latency, that means that your data is not being received correctly and obviously you're going to have delays and things like that. Um, so in terms of another thing is, is basically to look your best on camera. Um, so if you turn up for a normal business meeting, you might put like a shirt on, maybe possibly a tie, you might put some makeup on, um, things like that. So it's a question of looking your best on camera. And there's really four different elements to this. And these are kind of very similar to if you were just doing a standard sort of piece of filming. So the first one's camera placement. So it's where you put the camera at a webcam. Second one is lighting. And lighting is really critical. In, that's quite important. Then there's backgrounds. So in this case, as you can see behind me, I've just got a sort of standard quite basic background with a logo on, and then enhancements, so actually making things look sharper, making things look better. Um, so let's run through some of those now. So what we often see is when we're using laptops, we're often at a bad angle, we're kind of craning our necks like this, we're moving forwards, and it's not a flattering angle, and often our eyes are kind of looking downwards, and the way the camera lens does it will distort, and it will create um, problems with that. Again, if you're tall, it's not a problem for me, I'm five foot six, but again, if you're looking down, You'll often see this problem where people are kind of looming at the camera. Um, if you've watched any of the daily briefings, you'll notice that Robert Peston is really bad for this, but he's kind of looming forwards like this, and he just looks really weird, and it's quite unsettling. So again, kind of avoid doing that. And then you often see people as well, this is an occupational therapist nightmare, where people are kind of leaning forwards, and they're putting all the pressure on the joints at the front, they're kind of all the wrists are there in the front. And again, it's a really unflattering angle. Um, so it's just not, not great. And again, it's just really bad for your posture as well. Um, I had one Zoom meeting about three months ago when it was um, with a group of artists. And really, somebody was kind of lying sideways on the, on the chairs long, which I thought was a bit weird you know, during the meeting. So again, your posture is kind of important. It kind of, you know, it gives sense a message about how seriously you're taking the meeting. Um, so what I would suggest is to get the top line of the webcam, which is normally located, depending on your device, near the top of the screen. 
have that in line with your eye line um, as I'm doing now at the moment. And sometimes you might need to sort of reposition the screen slightly. You might need to tilt it a bit. And sometimes it's useful to actually put you, your laptop or your desktop and just have that on some books or a box or a stand because that will give it a better position. And don't be afraid to kind of move things around and kind of, if, the, if that position isn't correct. Here's a really good example as well. So this is, this is when it's done right. So this is the film director, uh, David Fincher. Now you'd expect um, a film director would probably know what they're doing with, you know, kind of lighting and positioning cameras, but this is a really good example. So in this case, um, you can see he's got natural light behind him, which is great because we're going to come to light him um, shortly. But that's giving a nice bit of kind of side definition to his face. He's sat up straight and the camera position is straight. And so his posture is kind of, he's smiling, he looks engaged and it's like, yeah, I want to have a chat with this guy and find out what, he's, uh, what he has to say. So again, that's a good example of how you frame things if you're doing a Zoom call. Um, and then in terms of lighting, um, so lighting is kind of often neglected, but it really improves your meetings. So what I would say is natural light is best. So if you can be located near a window, depending on where you're based, or if you have a natural light source, such as a skylight, something like that, that's ideal. Um, but ring lights are a really good way of vastly improving your image. Um, so ring lights are used a lot in photography, a lot of vloggers and influencers use them. If you go to like a cosmetics counter like Boots at Ebenham's, you'll always see like a huge ring light to make everything look great if you're having your makeup done. Um, and they're great because what they do is it, they give you warm diffused light that's well balanced. So I'm actually using one at the moment. I've got a ring, I've got just an overhead light um, above and then I've got a ring light to the side which is just kind of illuminating my face. So if I switch the ring light off now, then you'll see everything goes dark. So all the side of my face is dark. It doesn't give any definition. Switch it on again, and it just boosts everything up as well. So there's an example as well. That's just a still as well, as you can see that. So switched off and then switched on. And ring lights also have the benefit that they give a nice catch light in the eyes, so they make your eyes sparkle a bit more as well, which again makes it more engaging. So these things might seem trivial, but they have a, they do play a role in terms of how people perceive you and also just in terms of making you look your best. Then backgrounds, um, they can be useful if you want to include a logo, as in this example, or in some cases you might want to hide things. So you, if, you, if you, you know, doing a, you know, if you've got an untidy kitchen or something like that, you might have, you know, laundry in the corner, you want to hide stuff and the background is quite useful. What I would say is don't have a distracting background or anything that's kind of too wacky because that can undermine the credibility. So I would always say less is more. Um, Zoom supports green screens as well. So if you can get like a cheap green screen from somewhere, then it will actually do that, do, give you quite a nice result. It will actually key out around you in a quite an accurate way. Um, so here's a couple of examples. So I'd say this first one, as you can see I'm using it at the moment, that's kind of simple and clean. So if you had your corporate logo or maybe just a single colour, that's quite a clean way of doing it. This one in the middle, using the stock imagery of, um, of Hawaii, it's probably a bit distracting. It's probably a bit, I'm not sure, it looks a bit like you're in a cocktail bar somewhere, which might not be what you're trying to convey. And then obviously you've got this kind of one of Doctor Who's TARDIS, which again, you know, if you're working for like BBC or Doctor Who, it's probably all right. But if you're trying to do a serious business meeting with your accountant or bank manager, probably not, not the best image to convey. So again, think about the what you're trying to project as a business, what you're trying to project as an individual when you're using those backgrounds. And then enhancement. So what I'd always suggest is set your video quality to HD and that will give you the best quality. And Zoom is pretty good for this. Zoom generally has decent video quality. Obviously it's somewhat dependent on your connection as well. Um, things like Google um, Meet don't, aren't quite as sharp. So Zoom is, is pretty good for that. Um, depending on your webcam, you sometimes might need to mirror the video as well. So things appear the right way around. So I was in a presentation a couple of months back and the guy had a lot of PowerPoint slides behind him and he hadn't mirrored his screen so everyone's coming the wrong way around and it just looked really, really confusing. So again, you can check these things before you actually go um, do the um, Zoom call and I can show you how to do that in a second. And then there's a real, really cool feature called Touch Up My Appearance, um, which to me is a game changer. It's brilliant because if you're just feeling a bit rough in the morning or you just haven't had enough sleep, it just gives a slight smoothing filter, a bit like Photoshop. It gives a very soft kind of blur to, to the image. So it still looks okay, but it just means it, it softens things up a bit. So it's a bit like um, having kind of digital Botox, if you like. And then there's an example here. So when you go into the settings in Zoom, there's an option on video. And then you can obviously enable things like uh, widescreen, enable HD on there. There's the mirror my video um, op option on there. And obviously you can use a touch at my appearance. And again, those are all quite useful in terms of enhancing the image. Um, 
and then sound as well. So, you know, we've all sat through kind of screencasts, you know, video meetings where there's loads of noise going in the background. There might be kids running around, cats running around in our case. There might be people with road drills outside, planes going over. So try and avoid those if you can, but it's not always possible to do that. Um, so there's one tool that is particularly useful. It's a tool called CRISP and it removes, voice, uh, removes noise automatically. It uses AI. Um, what it does, it listens for specific frequencies, so it can detect the frequencies in a human voice within a range, and then it could work out, say, all oh, right, that's an air conditioning unit, lower that sound volume, or that's a, a road drill, lower that, and that will that really improve the quality of your audio. Um, that's a free tool, um, although it, and it gives you so many minutes a month to use, and that actually works on, uh, on mobiles as well, so you can use that to improve your call quality, and that works on Zoom, it works on Google um, Meet and some of the other platforms. Google are also um, rolling out their own noise reduction system as well. Um, that's not for available for all users. That that's kind of um, some of the largest sort of corporate users are getting that first of all. But that will eventually be available on Google Meet as well. And then Blue Jeans, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, they use Dolby Voice, which is a really sophisticated kind of noise reduction system as well. Um, but for the vast majority of things, I would recommend using Crisp, and it's a very simple thing to install. You just go on the website, and it'll talk you through it within 30 seconds. You can have that working and it will actually start filtering your sound and making it sound better. Um, and another thing um, a lot of people do is we've all nowadays got, you know, often have flat screen TVs, large screen TVs in our living room. Sometimes it's good just to get a better picture by plugging them in. Um, so you often if you're working off a small laptop screen, you can't always see meeting participants, you can't always get a sense of what's going on. Uh, most of them have an HDMI connection. Most, you know, PC laptops will have an HDMI out in a Mac, uh, as I'm using now. It's a display port to HDMI cable. So just plug it in. You'll get better image quality in a lot of cases, and it'll often make your meetings feel more engaging. Now, just to give you an example, I was uh, invited to a meeting yesterday by Reuters with um, Tony Blair, in, in actually involved in that. And so I just thought, actually, I'm going to watch this through um, my TV. And it just made the whole experience a lot more you know, engaging. It was more interesting to watch the responses and the questions that were being, being made. So again, you know, if you've got a TV, plug it in. That's a good, good way of doing that. Um, and then something that a lot of people kind of, you know, need to, don't always take seriously with Zoom, but probably should take seriously is security. Um, a lot of people, you've probably seen a lot of press stories saying like, ooh, Zoom, there's problems with it, it's not secure. And often it's down to the implementation of how people set things up. Um, so when you have a Zoom account, you'll have what's called a PMID, which is a personal meeting ID. And that used to be the default way of setting up a meeting. Um, what I would suggest if you're creating meetings, it gives you the option to generate a unique ID, which is a much more secure way of doing things. Um, it just means that if somebody got hold of your personal meeting ID um, and you weren't using a password, for instance, they could potentially get access to your meeting. And you've probably seen this thing where you've got hackers and people like Zoom bombing meetings and getting taken over them. So if you use a, a unique meeting ID and also use a password with that, that will make it much more secure. Another thing I'd suggest is if you've got a meeting with multiple people is to turn off file sharing. Um, and that just means that people can't and suddenly start introducing you know, video or start introducing um, potential things that might have malware and things like that. Um, another thing, if you've got a larger meeting, it can be useful to sometimes mute participants by default. And that just means that people um, you know, aren't allowed to speak initially, but obviously then you can open that up as the meeting progresses. Um, one thing I would recommend, as we've done in this case, is set up a waiting room so, um, where people can't join the, the, um, the meeting until the host decides that they're allowed to, to be in. That just makes things a bit simpler and it also you know, gives you an extra level of protection. Um, and another thing you can do is to lock the meeting once it starts. So if you're expecting four or five people Four or five people turn up, lock the meeting, and that will prevent anybody else from gaining access. So it's just another security step that you can take as well. Um, here's a little short video so just to give you an example of some of the security um, things you can look at as well. Zoom can be made to be a very secure platform, particularly with end-to-end -end encryption being rolled out across all of the different um, pricing tiers. Um, there's a few things you need to bear in mind when you're setting up and scheduling a meeting. So let's just take a quick look through those. So I've actually uh, got the, log, the, um, the Zoom app installed on my Mac, but you could do the same on your win on the Windows or on your, your mobile or your iPad. Uh, and I've, I'm actually logged in now. I'm going to go to schedule a meeting. So just click on that. So obviously you need to give it a topic. So I'm just going to call this uh, test 
completing. Uh, specify when you want it to be. I'm just going to so this is a, not a real meeting, so I'm just going to put in some uh, information on here. Uh, let's say that, and let's make it um, last um, an hour long. Now I'm on the paid version of um, Zoom, so uh, that will actually allow me to have longer meetings. The actual free version, as you probably may have seen, is the limits the meetings to 40 minutes, which is still pretty good. It probably allows you to do most of the stuff you need to do. And importantly, you get this um, meeting ID. Now, every Zoom account has what's called a PM ID, a personal meeting ID. Um, I would recommend this be generated automatically rather than using that, because if somebody gets hold of that and they were to somehow get your password, they could actually gain access to the meeting. Whereas if it's generated automatically, it's just more secure. So do that. Obviously, you're going to need a meeting password. Make sure that's ticked, which it normally is. Make sure you've obviously got the video on for both host and participants. Then for audio, what I normally do is, if you're not having people dial in, and just use computer audio, because the quality tends to be better. You've got a few options in terms of uh, scheduling. You've got Apple Calendar, iCal format, Google Calendar, or other calendars I just stick on Google normally. And then the next section is quite important as well. Click on Advanced here. And then you want to make sure Enable Waiting Room is ticked. And this just means that people have to wait for the host to begin the meeting and that just gives them somewhere to wait while it begins. And the host, when they're ready, he or she will then admit those people to the meeting. Uh, don't enable join before host because if somebody uh, who wasn't part of the meeting um, was to gain access, they could, they could take over the meeting. So don't have that enabled. Mute participants by entry, that's entirely up to you. If you're having a large meeting, let's say 20 people, it might be sensible to have that just so everybody's not talking, um, you know, all at once. Uh, but it's entirely up to you. Um, only allow authenticated users can join, sign into Zoom. Yes, you want that because it makes it much more safe. Uh, automatically record meeting, again, that's optional. You can specify where you want it to be saved. So you might want it to be saved to your local drive and then you can back it up and do what you need to do with it or in the cloud. Now in the cloud generally requires a paid subscription and you'll get a set amount of storage. So what you could probably do if you've got a free account is just save it locally and then store it, you know, wherever you need to do afterwards. And finally, alternative hosts is just in case something happens to the main host. So uh, people, you know, let's say the host was off sick or had a last minute thing in the meeting that still went ahead, but the person wasn't there. You could put in other email addresses in there and then people could contact those other individuals. Um, so let's just schedule that and it will go off and do its thing. It'll pick up, um, it'll ask you uh, which account you want to use and then it will confirm your choices. It's very good in terms of privacy and security, it will ask you all of these things. That will then schedule the meeting, put it what's in the calendar. Obviously you've got a link and then that link can be shared with your participants. So that's really all there is to it. So that's quite straightforward, but it's important to include those other security uh, um, points just to make sure that you're fully uh, covered. Okay, um, so there's a few tips there and then there's uh, some additional ones with an additional video just on this URL. Uh, and obviously this recording will be available afterwards so you can go back through any of the slides and have a look through that. Um, so in terms of recording meetings as well, just a few things to bear in mind. What I normally would suggest is to inform all attendees before recording takes place so they have the option to opt out. That's just good sort of uh, best practice really in terms of GDPR. Also give people the option to edit out comments where applicable. So if it's a formal meeting, there might be um, you know, comments that are made that need to be off the record. So again, give people the option to do that. And then the Zoom pay tiers, as I mentioned, have cloud storage options. So again, that's just a way that you can actually store that um, and then come back to it at a later date. Um, taking notes. Um, now, if it's a formal meeting, again, sometimes people might take minutes of that. Um, one tool I particularly like is uh, Otter AI which is a transcription tool. Um, it's a freemium tool, so it's a, it's a, it's a certain level of, um, a bit like Zoom, certain level of functionality for free. And it allows you to have up to 600 minutes per month in the free tier, and then it's in a sliding scale upwards. Um, but it's really good. You can actually have live transcription of Zoom meetings, but that becomes slightly more expensive. So what I would tend to suggest is if you have a recording of a Zoom meeting or any other video that you want to be transcribed, you upload it to Otter in the cloud, and normally after a few minutes, it will then transcribe all of that audio so you can then use it for subtitles or you've got a full record of it. So it just saves, if you've got like an hour long meeting, it saves people having to take all the notes because the AI tool also can do that for you. And it's actually incredibly fast and precise. 
So you'll see kind of a lot of kind of live transcription stuff, um, live subtitles, people on things like YouTube, really, really inaccurate. We don't like the Yorkshire accent either in some cases, um, but it's actually really, really fast and precise. So I've used it on a lot of projects. So it's really good. Um, and then meeting etiquette, standard really. Um, what I would always say is helpful to have some ground rules at the start, particularly if you've got new participants involved. So all the usual stuff, respect, courtesy, active listening. Um, as a host, I think it's a good idea if you've got a larger meeting to mute attendees and then unmute them as they want to speak. If you've got a lot of people in a meeting, sometimes it's useful to ask people to raise their hands. So it might just say, raise your hand on camera, something like that. And then, and then you can unmute them. And that's, or they can use a notification tool. There's a button within the Zoom they can use for that. And what I would always say is try to involve everybody in the room. So not just focus on who's got the loudest voice. So often you'll have a couple of people might dominate a meeting and not necessarily the most informed, but they've got the loudest voice. So just try and involve everybody you can, um, you know, within that meeting. Um, and then another thing, the first one sounds a bit, off, a bit weird, but is it the right approach? So Zoom is great for things like this, for webinars, or where you're trying to maybe meet a new client and discuss things. But in some cases, it might not be the right approach. It might be better to have an email or a phone call. So just consider that beforehand. Um, obviously, within the free tier, you've got 40 minutes, um, which for most meetings is probably okay. Um, obviously, if you need a longer meeting, you can uh, obviously use a paid option. And that will give you up to 24 hours. So uh, why somebody would want a 24 hour long meeting, I'm not quite sure. What I would always say is keep your meetings focused. And as part of that, having an agenda can really help focus the mind and make sure that you're staying on topic and you're trying to achieve the objectives. Um, another thing I'd suggest is probably try and avoid having too many participants. So Zoom allows up to 50 people on a standard tier. But again, that's probably too many. Um, I like the two pizza rule, and this is something that Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon came up with. And he had a rule that basically, never have a meeting that you can't feed all of the participants for two pizzas. So I think that's a really good rule of thumb actually, for often when you having too many people involved, it can become quite difficult. And there's also this concept of Zoom fatigue. Um, so there's been quite a lot of coverage recently with psychologists talking about this. And really you're trying to sort of, Cognitively, it's quite difficult because you're trying to kind of like pick up nuances, you're trying to pick up body language, all within a small screen. So normally where you'd be able to read things like non-verbal cues, signals that people are giving you, it's much more difficult in a virtual space. So if you do a couple of Zoom meetings a day, I had a, last week had about four in a day, it can become quite wearing and quite difficult sometimes because it's quite a challenge. So again, just be aware of that. And sometimes it's helpful to keep the meeting shorter and more focused and that avoids um, Zoom fatigue. Um, now we're just gonna to touch briefly on live streaming, uh, which again is, is really sort of taken off, particularly as we're spending a lot more time online with lockdown. So the landscape is obviously other channels, but these are the big players. So there's Facebook Live, which we're actually streaming to today as part of this as well. There's Instagram, uh, which is obviously owned by Facebook, but Instagram is, uh, is becoming increasingly live focused as well. YouTube have live, um, is very well uh, defined and, and used as well. And then you've got Twitch, which is owned by Amazon, which is primarily used to be a gaming channel. So lots of people, you know, um, live playing video games like Fortnite and things like that. It's increasingly being used as a, as a technical channel as well. So a lot of companies are starting to use that as a, as a way of kind of promoting their, um, their services as well. Um, one piece of software I do really like is called OBS, which is open broadcasting software. And it's a free application. You can download it from that PC and Linux. Um, what it allows you to do is you can combine live video, pre-recorded video, audio, captions, logos, pretty much anything you want, and you can combine it into scenes. Um, this is used a lot by professional streamers, and it allows you to really easily stream to things like Facebook Live. You can stream to Instagram if you have a plugin, which is free again. YouTube is really straightforward, and Twitch. And all you have to do is basically have an account on each of these, you would start a, uh, create a new stream, it creates uh, an API key, which you then link to this piece of software. And the other thing you can do with OBS is you can also record things offline. So again, you can have almost like a multiple camera setup. So you can have some of you talking about the business potentially, you can have like a trailer or you know, some video clips, you can show images in a gallery and you can make it all look really professional and save it offline. So OBS is quite a nice tool. We obviously don't have time to cover it today, but if anybody wants to know more about it, has the appetite to do a session on it, I'd be very happy to, to talk a bit more about that sometime. Um, and then streaming hardware. Um, streaming hardware used to be prohibitively expensive, you know, you're talking kind of thousands of things. 
Um, but Roland, who make uh, guitar effects pedals and synthesizers, things like that, they brought out a new piece of hardware called the Livecast, and that allows you to connect things like your laptop, your phones, musical instruments, microphones, and it just gives you a really nice way of kind of live streaming, and so you can just hit the buttons and then select and, and switch between them. So it just makes it much more intuitive. Um, and then just a quick survival guide for live streaming. You get permission. Obviously, if you're filming people, make aware that make them aware of being filmed and ideally if you have a release form that can help as well. Plan ahead. I'd suggest not having a script in some cases but have an outline of what you're doing, possibly some pre-prepared questions so you don't have any kind of awkward silences. Use a tripod, obviously if you're using things like a laptop it's less of an issue but again if you're doing anything with mobiles make sure you've got a nice steady um, you know, view. Um, it can make things look more professional and you get some really nice kind of affordable tripods and gimbals as now as well, which uh, really improve the, the look of things. Stay charged up, sounds obvious, but if you're streaming from a mobile, make sure you've got a full battery. Likewise, plug in laptops to avoid cutting out. You don't want to get halfway through a stream and realise that you've run out of batteries. Have a plan B. Um, touch wood, we've been very lucky with this so far. <laughs> Think that sometimes things can go wrong. So make sure you've got a fallback position keep viewers informed if you've got any technical difficulties. Keep it legal, and by that I mean just avoid licensed music, video or images. People often think, oh, it's a live stream, it doesn't matter, it's just going to be, um, you know, available once, but often live streams are archived and available afterwards. So what you'll often find is um, all the main systems, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, they use a content ID system. So what that means is there'll be a database of music tracks that are from record companies and it will check in real time against them. So for instance, if you were doing the DJ set and you played a specific record, Facebook could kill the stream because obviously then you're in, in copyright um, infringement. And that can be, have some ramifications for your channel. So if you're on YouTube, if you get copyright strikes, you're only allowed a couple of strikes and then your channel can be taken off. So again, good idea to try and keep things um, you know, above board and not use licensed co copy, um, copyright material. On the clock, what I would suggest by that is be aware of different time zones. Um, so for instance, if a lot of your audience is in the US, make sure that you're not broadcasting at three o'clock in the morning and just that you're aware of the time zones that you're going out in. Um, engage your audience, so ask some questions, try to get them involved, get them to contribute. Um, you may, if you do publicising the stream, you might want to ask questions ahead of time and then you can go through them and vet them a bit. Uh, but make them feel like an active participant in the process. And then, it's a good idea to have moderation, so it's expected what's happening today. I'm, I'm talking, Chris is talking, and then a number, another member of the team is looking at comments, handling quick queries and questions. So again, that's a good, good idea to do that. And don't be afraid to moderate and remove offensive comments. So if somebody puts something really offensive or stupid, just get rid of it. And then promotion, uh, publicising your events ahead of time, just as we've done with all Digital U, is a really effective strategy, so use social media. Use your other marketing channels as well, so email campaigns. You can also set up Facebook, Facebook watch parties, which creates a little page so people can then share that with their friends and they can get involved. Facebook Premier is quite an interesting approach because that's um, where you can take pre-recorded video but actually um, push it almost like a live stream so people can comment in real time. It feels like a live stream, but it takes some of the risk out of it. Um, and then YouTube Premier is a good way of boosting engagement levels as well. So, does anybody have any questions at this point, or are you happy to move on? Let me just move this out a moment. We had one from Nikki a little bit earlier, Rich. Um, yeah. Might be going back a little bit. We talked, yeah. I think she just kind of missed, missed the bit about the upload speed. That's um, how many MPS upwards is okay for streaming? Yeah, I think upwards is probably anything over, over about five is probably fine for, for Zoom. Um, the recommend, they say you think the minimum recommendation is about two, but I think that could still result in some lag. Uh, generally, if you've got broadband and it's, you know, it's reliable, you'd probably be, be looking in excess of that. So it's, I think it's more of an issue where you're using things like um, you know, 4G and 3G connections are really a no-no because you're just going to lose that connection. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, and then I've got a question coming from Rachel. Um, are there any recommended times, or is there a recommended time if you are doing a live stream on Facebook, i.e. length of stream? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, it varies. What I would say is a minimum of 15 minutes, um, probably no more. It depends really on the content. 
Um, I would probably say no more than an hour. Um, but what I would say is often people drop in and out of those, so it's quite useful sometimes to do recaps. Um, a bit like you might have on a radio show where you do like a station call out or an ident, and it might be just reminding people kind of what they're watching, because often what will happen is somebody might start watching the stream, or share it with a friend, they'll come into the stream 20 minutes in, and then they'll think, oh, what, what's he on about? What, what, what is this about? Yeah. So doing like a recap maybe of 10 minutes or something, or, or even if you use something like, oh, you could have like a little piece of branding, like a little logo, or, or just like an interstitial that kind of explains kind of what it's about, what people can expect really. So, uh, but yes, good question. And I think it does vary, but what I would avoid is kind of, you see some of these Twitch streams that last about 12 hours and you think, you know, yeah. who's going to watch this? And then you think, well, actually in lockdown people might do, but I think generally about an hour is probably the, the sweet spot in terms of length. Yeah, and I suppose in reality, what, who can talk for four or five hours straight? I know some people can, they have that gift. But, you know. They have like cans of Red Bull maybe, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from the chat? Audience, anything? I had a couple, Rich, while we're waiting for Mars to drop in, that's all right. Yeah, just, sure. to, just to kind of enhance what you're going on, I have to ask you. You talked about equipment earlier for lighting and ring lighting. Obviously, I'm asking that because as you can see, I'm looking at my face. Exactly, I've got the natural light coming through from the window here. But yeah, I don't know yeah. So I'm just thinking, obviously, put myself in everyone else's position. Is where where's a good place to kind of get this equipment? Where would you recommend? Don't yeah, it's probably Amazon, and I'm not in any way sponsored by them. But um, in terms of just getting a cheap, decent ring light, I bought one. Uh, I used a lot of stuff, and it was twenty pounds. Uh, it just links straight into the USB port. So I've got it plugged in at the moment as I'm speaking. You can spend a lot more money on them for really professional ones, but to be honest, for the majority of stuff, you know, I've used it on photo shoots, I've used it on video shoots, and it's absolutely fine. Um, and it just it just gives a much more balanced, you know, kind of um, you know lighting effects. It softens the skin, mm. and just makes so if I switch it off now. I yeah, can, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, I'm looking at you compared to me, and it's yeah, you obviously you look nice and shiny and, and bright, <laughs> and I'm half like, half a pizza type thing. Half yeah, bright. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, what I would suggest is sometimes it's useful to have a bit of a play around with your lighting and your position of the camera um, before. Obviously, if you're going to zoom in preferences, then you can check your camera settings beforehand. So, um, you know, I think it's like if you're shooting video, um, you know, the camera's important, but the lighting's probably just as important. Yeah. Uh, and we work on this principle of kind of um, three point lighting as well. So, ideally, like you've got, and Chris, you've got kind of light coming from the side, natural light, which is great. So if you then balance that with like a ring light on the other side, that's all the better. If you want to go really full on, you can backlight as well, and that gives like a halo to the hair, but that's probably got wow. over. <laughs> <laughs> I like these webinars, I like Zoom, but I'm not that obsessed with it. Yeah, you're not, yeah, you can get like a, a wind machine before your hair. Oh, I've got my lockdown haircut kicking in. <laughs> um, so it's quick, so if, if I was to move this desk around them, you can make use of this natural light to the side of me that you can see in the background of mine with the tree. So would yeah. I be best to have that line behind me, as in so I'm facing the camera, and then the yeah, lights behind me? It's, it, it's good to have it at the side. Um, and then ideally, the, the best position is kind of if you have a bit of natural light or a light behind you as well, but off camera. Mm. Um, so what you probably want, in the ideal setup, what you really want is kind of natural light like you've got on your side. You probably want a ring light, kind of just pointing towards you, kind of maybe about 45 degrees. You yeah. play around with your position. And then mm. ideally you kind of want a bit of light behind you, but off camera. And then that'll just kind of light. So that's kind of three point lighting. So pretty much any Hollywood film uses that. If you want, if you choose to do it professionally, it will use that, that kind of system. Um, that's really useful. Thank yeah, you. And obviously what you want to avoid is what you often see is people will have kind of like a dimly lit room. And then they'll have light in kind of underneath them, which is a terrible idea because it just emphasises all of your flaws. Yeah, on your door chins. Yeah, it's, I mean, I've got, yeah, it's what's called, <laughs> it's what's called in the, it used to be called monster lighting, and it's when you used to see all the old um, sort of horror films about the ghosts and stuff used to light up. Yeah. Like, oh, it everything was horrible. Um, yeah. So you often see that particularly with people when they have the light underneath and it just looks shocking. So, yeah, just nice natural balanced light. I think that's what you're after. Excellent, thank you. Now, just to clarify, that's called a ring light. It's a ring light, yeah. What I could do, I could, well, we could send down the link afterwards. If, if yeah, please, that'd be useful. I'm just thinking of my own, my own selfish gain there. I think, yes, I need, I need to need some lighting, so that's that'd Yeah, because the other thing it'll do as well is it just puts a catch light in your eyes, and the catch light is just where you can see like the reflection of the light in your eyes, and it just makes things a bit, look a bit more dynamic. So if you look at most like 
fashion shoots or anything like adverts to be a catch light within the model's eyes. So it just makes it a little bit more interesting. <laughs> Oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, I know I've kind of taken over the conversation now, but I'm just personally curious about that. Yeah, um, I suppose any more questions from chat? Um, any Q, anything that's burning questions? I've got one more if yeah. nobody else has. Fire away. Um, okay, so the last one from me then, Rich. I suppose and we'll close it out there unless something drops in. Zoom fatigue. I can definitely, definitely feel that one this week. We're doing. Well, this is now the 13th webinar of the week or so, 13 or 14. In fact, definitely Zoom fatigue is real. Obviously, it's hard to keep going and obviously it's tiring because you're constantly thinking about things and you think. Any, I suppose, tips on dealing with that from your own experience? How, you, how do you deal with it? Um, I think probably just to try and be as relaxed as you can. Obviously, it's not always possible in every meeting, but just to kind of like put people at their ease to begin with. I think often it's difficult where people are, are almost giving a performance. So obviously you want to look your best, but you don't need to you know, feel like you're going to have to be perfect in, in everything. Um, and I think the other thing is probably try and keep your meetings as short as possible. So I think by having a focus meeting where you might say, right, we're going to spend 20 minutes and we're going to discuss X, Y, and Z, and we're going to complete that. That's a much better way than having a free form meeting where everybody's just saying, oh, well, we might discuss this and let's have 10 minutes going around in circle. I think where you want to avoid that in a normal meeting, it's particularly relevant in Zoom because it's just because it is so taxing in a sense, mentally and you know emotionally to try and like you know convey things in a in a small square on a screen, you know. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd probably just keep things focused um, and, and try and schedule it so you don't have too many in a day. So I think you know, say if you could do like maybe a couple in a day maximum. I think if you try and do like. 10, you know, you know, like 10 in a day, it would probably drive you crazy, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So am I, uh, is there another section, Rich? I can't remember. If... Yeah, there's another couple, actually. Yeah, we, we're still moving the hour. Um, but ah, still... cool. Sorry, I'm manipulating. I thought, it was, I, thought it was, I thought it was all done in one. All right, okay, we'll just okay, drag it out with some chat and some conversation. Yeah, sorry. So right. we're going to off, um, we're gonna have a look at um, Apple Clips. And then, cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll be quiet and hide That's myself. Crazy. Bye. All good questions. Thanks, Chris. So, yeah, perfect. So what we're going to have a look at now is Apple Clips, and um, it's a free iOS app, so it works on all mo on iPhones, um, on iPads, and you can download it for free. Um, what it does, it allows, gives you professional quality animated templates, licensed music, and it works seamlessly with iCloud. So if you've got an iCloud account, it will back everything up automatically. So here's an example of a video. This was a video uh, I just made on it, and I'll just play this. So that's an example, that was just, uh, that's not a real client, it's just the fictitious hairdressers because um, we're all coming out of lockdown, we all need a bit of a trim. Um, so I thought that would be quite a nice example. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to play back um, an example of how Clips works. This lasts about around about 10 minutes. Um, now this is pre-recorded and the reason being it's just because it's on a phone, we'd have to plug in various different things and we might lose connection. So this is pre-recorded. Apologies if I look a bit rough at the beginning, I just had dreadful hay fever that day, so uh, I'm just going to cover myself with that. So I'm just going to start playing this back now, and you can see how we built that last video. When you first open clips, it will open in video selfie mode. So it will record everything that you're saying, uh, and obviously if you hold down the, the pink button to record it. Uh, a particularly useful feature is the live captioning, the live titles, and to enable that, all we need to do is just click on this um, word bubble uh, just about midway down on the left hand side and then you've got live titles and you've got different styles if you just sideways scroll through those there's various different um, styles you can have i'm just going to select this one and i'm just going to hit the x button to close that down and now if i start recording if i just press the pink button and hold that down and speak so now i'm going to start recording and it's going to pick up everything that i'm saying hopefully so I'll release that, and then if we play back the scene by pressing the play button, as you can see, that's picked up everything that I'm saying, which is really helpful, which is good. Um, that's great. So that can be quite useful as well. Um, obviously, you can go in there as well, and you can make changes to that should you wish. Um, but the main thing, um, reason we're going to be using clips today is to um, look at how we might be able to do nicely animated 
um, videos for social media, it might be Facebook, it might be Instagram advertising, things like that. Um, so for now, I'm just going to turn off that mode. So I'm just going to turn off live titles. Again, just click on that uh, word bubble there. And I'm just going to close this down. So in clips, everything's arranged into separate scenes. So to edit a scene or get rid of a specific scene, just click on it and then hit delete and that will delete it. Great. So what we're going to be using is some pre-existing assets that we've got. So the easiest way to do that is to click on library. And as you can see, I've got a few sort of quite nice stock images here. Um, and what I thought would be quite fun to do today would be to do a, a very quick ad for a fictitious hairdressers because obviously a lot of people needed haircuts with uh, COVID-19. Lockdown um, is being relaxed um, in a couple of weeks. So here's just like a fictitious ad just to show you how this works. So we've got this kind of quite cool looking chap here uh, with sunglasses on. We're going to have him as the first scene, so that's good. Now that's a nice image, but what we might want to do is add a bit of text to that. So what we need to do is click on this um, little sparkly uh, star in the corner here. And um, then we've got various different text uh, options on here. I'm just going to select this one. And then to type, you just type over it. So I'm just going to say, have this as the opening slide. So I'm going to have this as great news. Uh, I'm just going to put an exclamation mark on there. So it's put it on there, but it hasn't really put it in the best place. So you just to hold and drag down, just hold to get it into position. Again, you can kind of use punch to, you know, pinch and punch to resize, just as you would a normal image uh, if you use it my Instagram. And then I'm just going to close that down by hitting the uh, X there. And then what we need to do is get this in as the first scene into, uh, into our clip. So to do that, we just hold down this pink button here in the middle, and then at the top of the screen, you'll see it has a number of seconds. I'm just going to release that now, and that's around about two seconds. If you want to just see our first scene in there, we just press the play button at the bottom, and as you can see, it just put a small anima animation on that text just to make it look a bit more dynamic. Great. So now what we're going to do is add our next image. Um, again, you can use footage as well. If you've got footage, you can use whatever you want, really, from various different images, diagrams. I'm going to take this other chap, um, again, also wearing a red hat for some reason. Um, and in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go again to here, um, and then I'm just going to scroll through on here. Uh, I'm going to actually use this one, because it's quite a nice looking one. It's, the, um, it's kind of a red sticker with an animation. And uh, I'm just going to put, uh, we are open, and you don't need to worry too much about the formatting because the formatting is fairly good. It will generally pick up things on here. We are open for of July and apply that on there. And then we can just drag that, hold that down. In this case, what I want to do is just is turn it around. So I'm just going to use two fingers and just sort of twist it around a little bit and just resize it just so it looks a bit more, a bit larger. Happy with that. And then we'll just close down with the X. And then we just need to get it in the scene again. So again, hold down the pink button. And as you can see, it's put a little curl there as it puts it on two seconds. Great. And we can play back the whole of our clip anytime just by uh, pressing the, um, the play button in the corner. So we've got our great news is our first section. Then we've got the other chap here. Let's add in another individual. And um, I'm just going to pick this, uh, this lady here. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to, uh, again, repeat the process. I'm just going to add some text on here. This one's quite nice. So I'm just going to say book now. I'm just going to make this the call to action. Um, exclamation mark. Again, that's quite large. So I'm just going to resize that a little bit. Just rescale it around. It doesn't have to be exact. You, you know, it's quite forgiving. Again, I'm just going to put that on for two seconds. Again, let's put a little animation on there, which is good. Um, then I'm just going to um, put obviously a number where people can contact the salon. So I'm going to select this lady here. And then I'm just going to put um, on here. What I'm going to do is this is quite a nice one for numbers. So I'm just going to say call us if I can type <laughs> on. And then I'm just going to put a, a fake number on here because this is obviously just a demo. Um, perfect, apply. Then I'm going to move that around. I'm going to rescale it a bit just using the uh, sliders. So that looks okay. What we might want to do now is add a sticker just to give it a bit more life. I'm just going to scroll through and there's quite a nice arrow one here. And again, I'm just going to move that round. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, I'm just going to maybe overlap it a bit as well, just to make it look a bit more designed. Perfect. And then just close that down with the X. 
And again, I'm going to leave this on screen a bit longer because people have to obviously absorb the number and take it down. So I'm going to give this one four seconds by holding down the pink number and there, the button. And there we are, you see? That then animates. So that's four seconds, that's perfect. And then what we want to do is probably finish things off with a nicely styled animation. And one of the great things about Clips is it has these um, really nicely styled posters which are built and professionally animated and, and uh, look fantastic. So there's loads of different options on there. There's even some Disney options as well and Star Wars and things like that, should you wish. Uh, in this case, I've got this abstract one um, that looks quite sophisticated. So I'm just going to um, just again click to, to edit the type and I'm just going to call uh, just going to call the prestige hair design. Um, and I'm just going to obviously type in that like that. Lovely and apply. And then I'm going to hold this down again for four seconds. Now, as you can see, that animates really nicely. That looks really slick. Perfect on that. Um, so all of those sections are in place. Now, one thing you need to remember is obviously sometimes when you're actually creating these, it will actually try and pick up your voice at the same time. Um, so all you need to do is click on the individual uh, clips here and just go mute. So just mute those. Lovely. And so hit done. Now, if I want to then obviously play back what I've got so far, I can play that back. That's looking quite nice so far. We've got the book now. Obviously got the colours. And then we finish with the branding. And obviously that could include a logo, it could include any, any aspects you want. So that's looking nice. What we might want to do is just fine tune that a bit. So we want to make sure that all of the breaks uh, are in the, got in the right place. So to do that, again, really simple. Just click on the uh, bit you want to edit and go trim. And as you can see, that's actually three seconds long. So what we need to do is just where we've got these handles here, we can drag them each way. I'm just going to make that two seconds and then trim in the corner there, hit trim. I'm just going to repeat the process for the others. Trim. And then I'm going to um, go to this one here uh, for book now and just repeat that again. Okay, it's 2.8. Uh, again, for this one, just going to make that it's actually quite long. That's, that should be four seconds. It's 4.9, nearly five. And again, uh, just make this one, let's make this one four seconds. Perfect. So that's actually trimmed that. That's actually made the edits. But it's great, but it's a bit flat. It needs some sound, it needs some music on there. So to do that, what we need to do is we can click on this um, little uh, musical notes icon in the corner in the top right. And there's various different licensed soundtracks that come with it in different genres. Um, so you can go all these different sections and you can have a look um, and uh, you can see on here. So let's have a, have a quick look um, and click and um, see the different types of music that are available. So if we click here, you can hear that one's quite, Rocky, it's okay. No, we've got one that's a bit more of a house one, but probably not ideal. So let's just click on this one. That sounds quite nice. So if we then go back here using the back arrow, hit done. And then if we um, obviously play our clip, let's start again. So let's press play. So that's great. So that's really all we need to do. And um, the nice thing with clips as well is it will synchronize. So it, the music will synchronize perfectly to the length of your video. So you don't need to worry about um, having to edit it or, or fade it in and out and things like that. So again, that saves a lot of time. When you're happy with the video, all you then need to do is click on this um, bottom um, icon in the bottom right, and then you're given options and then you can obviously save the video. So if you save the video, um, that will then save it to your camera roll and then obviously then you can then save to library and then you can use that however you wish. So you can put it on Facebook, put it on Instagram, uh, put it on Instagram story, uh, LinkedIn, whichever platform you want, that, that will work. And uh, obviously the video is, uh, is H square format, but it's full HD quality, it's 1080p. So it looks really sharp and it will work really well. So that's the, uh, that's the basic intro um, to Clips and uh, I hope you enjoy it and find it useful. 
Okay, so um, so that's clips in a really, really short um, kind of guide, really, a nutshell. Has anybody got any questions on that at all? Yeah, that was really, I really like the fact that you've pre-recorded that and a good demo there, Rich. That's oh, cool. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I like it. So obviously I know I put myself in, they're trying to do stuff like that live's a nightmare because tech never works when you're doing these live right. things. Yeah. So that, that was really useful and obviously people can re-watch it. Um, just got the one question, I think, specific with this. Um, is there an Android app equivalent? Um, not really in terms of clicks. There are things, there's a, there's a couple of decent video tools which again I'm happy to share on email. Uh, KineMaster's quite a good one, that's, that's a, a free product. Uh, but Clips is kind of fairly unique because it does things like the synchronization of the audio. I don't know anything else that does that, um, that I'm aware of. But there are, there are some good Android options as well, so I'm happy to send those going through as well. Okay. Cool. I think you've got all the final tech units here, Rich. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, yeah. And then just the last sort of section, if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. One last question, Rich. Did you, oh, sorry, did you just dropped in. On that, um, if you wanted to record your voice with video instead of music, when and how would you do that? Um, well, you could just use clips for that. So what you could do is you could basically um, place a uh, an image in the, in the scene and then just narrate over the top of it. So you just basically record your voice speaking over it. Clips would then allow you to um, just record that as well. Um, another thing it does is it, it, which is quite nice, if you've got any kind of narration, um, if you've got any kind of speech on that. If you put the audio, um, use, use the clips audio, it will actually automatically adjust the volume. So the music will be slightly quieter on the bits where people are speaking. So in recording, that's called ducking. And normally if you do that in say Premiere or something, you have to mess about with audio levels. But if you're doing that in clips, it just automatically does it all for you. So again, it's quite a nice, nice tool for that. So yeah, great. Okay. great. Thank you, Rich. On to the final. Sorry, the last five minutes, if that's okay then, if people are happy with that. So yes, yeah, so we'll just have a, a quick look at podcasts. So you might have seen the worksheet that sort of came with stuff. Um, podcast use is exploding really, particularly with lockdown. Um, you know, 52% of UK adults listen to podcasts weekly. 73% uh, of us listen to podcasts on mobile. So that's the, by far the biggest platform, whether that's um, iOS or Android. Spotify uh, are doing huge amounts of spending on podcast content. Um, they've just signed Kim Kardashian, various other people, to do a podcast exclusively for them. So they spend $600 million in the last year on podcast content. And the average number of shows that the average listener listens to in a week is seven. So quite, quite high usage. I know I certainly listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of when people are really into that as a format, they listen to it quite extensively. So there's a few reasons why you might want to do it. So Building brand awareness is a good way. It's a good way of creating additional buzz about your company and a potentially an additional marketing channel as well. Um, it's a good way of showcasing what you do um, in a relaxed and informal way. It's not a hard sell. It's not trying to like say, buy our product. It's more like you might want to find out a bit more about what we do, the services we offer. Um, it gives you some really useful data so you can get really nice analytics and find out how people are listening to stuff on there, which is useful. Um, importantly, you reach an affluent audience as well. So there's quite a significant amount of data that suggests that podca podcast listeners, frequent listeners, can often have significant levels of disposable income, and they're often quite um, happy to kind of spend, you know, um, a bit more money in some cases. So that can be quite useful as well. And it also allows you to remain competitive. So as a lot of companies embrace audio, they might embrace, uh, they might be looking at things like podcasts, maybe Alexa and stuff like that. Don't get left behind, get, you know, make sure that you've got a stake in the ground when it comes to that as well. Um, so just a quick thing on how podcasts work. So you have a podcast episode, it's recorded and edited. It's, it's created as a digital file, usually an MP3, which is uploaded to a server. And then the podcast has a feed, which is a list of all of the episodes, all of the cover art and things like that. Then the new episode, and that's circulated and distributed to platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, etc. And then people can listen and subscribe to those. So you might subscribe to a podcast and then every time there's a new one, it sends it, downloads it to your phone and you can listen to the latest episode. Um, so in terms of if you wanted to do a podcast, there's a few quick interview questions and these are kind of quite useful bits of advice if you're filming people as well. What I tend to do whenever I do a podcast, I'll send out the questions ahead of time to allow people a bit of time to prepare. Maybe like a week before I just say, hey, we're going to meet on Monday have a chat, do the podcast. Here's a few questions that I'm going to ask. 
just so people have got a heads up on that. Make sure you got all your participants are at ease, make them feel comfortable. Um, and avoid making things too formal. Podcasts tend to be less formal, more conversational. Um, one approach I, t- I take with this is just to keep things rolling. If you're using a digital recorder, just keep things rolling all the time. Don't say like start and stop. Just as with a camera, often if you put people in front of a camera and say action, they freeze. But if you have the camera rolling and you just have a normal conversation with them, you tend to get much better results. Um, there's no real ideal podcast length. As it, it, it varies on the subject matter. Most of them tend to be anything between about 15 minutes to an hour. I'd suggest if you're starting out, probably 15 to 20 minutes is a good rule of thumb. You know, I've heard sort of like 15 minute long podcasts that are far too long and one hour long, long ones that feel too short. So it really depends on the, on the subject matter and the audience. Um, and again, a lot of people get really hung up on buying the most expensive gear and it's not, not often necessary. Um, Zoom itself gives you really decent audio quality and you can actually touch it up later on. Um, a good example of this is the latest Louis Through podcast on BBC Sounds. He's interviewed loads of different people recently and just used Zoom. And it's absolutely fine. It's, it's you know, broadcast, pretty much broadcast quality. Um, another way you can do it, and this is what, what I like to, to use, is um, a Tascam recorder. I mean, there's lots of digital recorders out there. I like Tascam because it's very easy to use. Um, about 80 pounds, again, on Amazon. Um, not, not an affiliate, but <laughs> it's a... Um, it's just, it's just an easy way to get that. That's got really simple controls, good battery life. Um, what I would suggest is whatever you're recording on, recording as high a quality as possible because it makes editing easier. So if you can record, you know, like 96 kilohertz, so really high quality because it will make things a lot easier later on. And then licensing, just as we mentioned before, of live streaming, don't use any music or sound effects you don't have the rights to. Um, a couple of royalty-free services I really like is uh, Facebook off of Facebook Sounds, which is part of the uh, Business Manager Creator, Creator Studio. That gives you really professional sounding audio from proper musicians, and you can use all of that without any kind of rights issues. YouTube also have an audio library, which again, is some excellent quality stuff, and you're not going to get a nasty rec- letter from a record company or a demand for fees and things like that. Um, editing, Audacity is a great tool, it's a free application. Uh, I've been using it for the last 10 years or so, and that allows you to do all the editing you need. You can enhance the quality using noise reduction. You can use what's called low pass filters, and they're really useful in terms of getting rid of noise. Um, what happens is it will filter out low frequencies. So, if, for instance, you have like a, a fan in the background, which is probably relevant this week, or you have like air conditioning, it, you can take that kind of noise out of the background. Um, you can also do normalization where it basically takes all the highs and lows and like averages them out and basically makes it sound nicer. So pretty much any record you listen to, any piece of music on like, I, you, you know, um, Apple Music or um, Spotify will use normalization and it just makes things sound nicer. So it means that there's less peaks and troughs um, and it's a bit easier to listen to on headphones. If you're exporting, um, always, I would suggest exporting to MP3 best quality 320 kilobits because that will give you more flexibility and what I often do if I have if I interview people for a podcast I send them a copy of the audio I just send them the files over beforehand so they're happy with it so they can sign it off so you're not going to get problems later on where you say well I didn't say that or you've read it in me and it doesn't sound right so again just to the point of courtesy that's a good idea and then distribution there's many different ways to distribute a podcast um I particularly like Acast Open. Um, it's a free solution for the first 10,000 downloads a month, which is quite a significant amount of traffic. Um, it's really simple to use and it allows you to easily upload and schedule things. So, for instance, what you can do is you can create um, seasons and then shows within that. Um, so, you could say, like, let's say you've got five interviews lined up, you can actually schedule them in a week apart and it'll then email you and alert you when those are available on the feed. Uh, it creates a feed. You can easily share with Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all the other directories. You can also publish to Spotify, SoundCloud and YouTube, but that's actually in the paid tier. Um, not expensive, but again, that's not out of the box. But you can certainly publish to Apple and Google and the others, um, you know, within that. Um, and then just a few sort of tips in terms of getting decent reach on your podcast. What I would suggest is write impactful episode titles and descriptions that are exciting that are going to get people to, to you know, learn more about it. Choose relevant categories. That's particularly relevant for Apple. We'll give you up to three different categories. So make sure it's in the right categories when you, when you um, create the, uh, the feed. 
good use of tags, a bit like YouTube, tagging can really help boost discoverability. So for instance, if you were doing a podcast about yoga or something like that, you might want to include yoga, you might want wellness, you might want various different aspects of that, you know, um, within that as, as tags and then people can easily find it. Um, it's sometimes useful, it's often useful to include contact details, including your website as well and your podcast so people can learn a bit more about your company. And as I mentioned, scheduling content during the seasons is really helpful as well. And then to finish things off, promotion, promote your podcast, use social media, so that might be organic and paid ads. Spotify now offer paid audio ads as well, so you can promote podcasts in that way. Email campaigns, if you've got MailChimp, like that can be a good way to build an audience as well. If you use an Acast, you get a player, uh, which is a bit like YouTube, where you can embed that within your website, so you can have the latest episodes available on there. Um, snippets and trailers are a good way as well, so you could say, say I've got an interview coming up next week on the podcast, here's a 15, 20 second trailer, put it on things like LinkedIn and Twitter. And you can also adapt live streams, so again, you could take a Zoom um, session that you're doing and you could take the audio out of that and obviously then convert that into a podcast. So that's a very, very quick run through podcasts, um, but yeah, again, happy to take any questions people might have. Yes, Rich, that's really, really useful. Um, I think you covered the only question we had dropping in there. Where do you put a podcast? You covered that really well. Obviously, that was the next slide. Yeah. Um, any questions? Oh, there we go. There's one popped in the Q&A. Is there a particular platform to promote a podcast? Um, not really. I mean, in terms of, the, you know, social media is probably your best bet in terms of, in terms of promoting it. Um, it's something that's still kind of lagging behind a bit in terms of the overall sort of ad units. Now Spotify are now aggressively going after podcasts and they're looking at new ad units that will feature podcasts more prominently. But what I would suggest if you're starting out, just make sure it's, it's covered on all your social media channels. Um, if you use a small like Acast, again, embed it in your, web, in your web page. So if you've got a blog or something like that, have, you know, just say, here's the latest blog, here's, here's a snippet of the, the latest podcast. So, um, but it's something that they are catching up to. I think previously Spotify just really cared about music and now they're realizing that people are listening to a lot more audio content in this format. Um, Apple are doing some major upgrades as well with iOS 14. Uh, so when that comes out, it's, it's gonna be a massive overhaul of the podcast um, app and much more personalization going on. Um, if you go on the Apple um, um, app as well, you can do full keyword searching as well, so where it'll do, it'll search your every description, every piece of description of text in the podcast and allow you to actually search. So it's a bit like Google really for podcasts. Mm -hmm. And obviously Google have their own, um, you know, network and directory as well. Um, what is interesting is a lot more people listening to podcasts on um, smart speakers as well. So as we're getting more things like Amazon Alexa devices, Google Nest devices, things like that in the home, people are listening to podcasts on that. So they might be saying, right, I'm cooking a lasagna tonight. I'll listen to a podcast while I'm doing that. So again, you know, there's, a, there's quite a big sort of surge in usage in that as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Rich. Unless there are any final questions, I know we've kind of just gone over the hour. Thank you. I yeah. think everyone stayed. So that's brilliant. That's, a, that's good. So you clearly kept everyone's attention there, Rich. Well done. <laughs> good, thank you. No, that was really, really useful, actually, from our perspective. That's all the stuff we're looking at doing next for, for my business. So I'm sure people in the attendees are thinking the same. Right. Um, so massive, massive thank you for, for your time. Um, yeah. Any final closing comments from you, Rich, before we close it out? Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming down. I uh, hope you found it useful. If you've got any questions, more than happy to, to kind of take those over email or just drop me a line on um, LinkedIn. Um, I'll just put, the, put those up there, but this will all be available afterwards anyway. And, and yeah. Chris has got all your details as well. Um, yeah, do get to it. Yeah, yeah always have to have a conversation about any of this and uh, if there's any way I can help, more than happy. Yeah. Thank you. And then just for transparency, the, the, the recordings and stuff will be made available afterwards so you can re-watch the bits you've missed and obviously please share it um, to somebody it might be useful to. Um, I'm just going to quickly plug the, because it's Friday, we've got the quiz at four o'clock. I'm going to drop the link into the chat now. So it'd be great if everybody and anybody could join us for a after work quiz at four o'clock this afternoon. The link's there in the chat with the, the private password. Um, so please join, have a bit of fun. There's lots of film and music, so it's going to be quite, we'll see. Um, brilliant, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Next one's at 12 um, and we'll go from there.
Thank you. Cheers, Rich. Have a great. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.